Hi, I'm Rob Penzak. I'm Jamila Bay. Welcome to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. And I have to say, I'm really excited about today's show, and not just because we have Jennifer Michael Heck, who's going to join us in a little bit, but I finally get to do a show with you, Jamila. Yay, isn't this awesome? It is for some of us. Now, <laughs> as I recall, the first time we were supposed to do a show, you know, I don't know, almost a year ago, you're like, oh, Rob, I got this hang now. I really don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. Uh, I fell and broke my toes. I was in the hospital and couldn't walk for a while. Maybe, maybe. We never saw any proof of that. Mm. The next time, I was once again got all psyched up, did all this kind of research, and then she's like, you know, I'm going to go see this marching band parade. I really don't think I can make it today. Uh, covering the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, a major international event that was uh, commemorated, and uh, as a journalist, I had to be there. Um, yeah, marching band, not so much. So pretty much you come equipped with an excuse for everything is what I'm taking for this, but that's just me. Um, but no, I really feel better. Thanks that, I mean, that you decided to come in and work with me today. I was told that I'd be on with Rick, Rick Wingrove or Elizabeth Cornwell. Um, pretty much um, anyone but you, Rob. In the fine print, there was a little asterisk, <laughs> and if you look down at the bottom there. Um, oh. At any rate, the reason I've been mm -hmm. so excited to you know, have a show with you is that, look, you're a descendant of Ham, right? You know, scorched black for the crimes of your forebears. What? Uh, y yeah. Yeah, and, and you're, you're just a woman, only a woman looking for a man to guide her on out of the path you know, from ignorance? I don't have a penis, so yes, I am, but merely a woman. Right, so that's what I was getting at. And you're an atheist. You're literally a goddamned atheist, literally. Uh, uh, yes, what, what? Right, so all I'm getting at is, <laughs> why don't you just go the extra mile? Don't what, you turn gay or something? Exactly, they can spread your satanic wings and kind of ride the love coming out of, you know, Arizona, Uganda, Ethiopia. Uh, well... Not that I don't love raising hell and causing problems, but um, I kind of like dudes, particularly the one I'm married to. Uh, it, it, it is what it is at the moment, Rob. Yeah, I'm so oh. glad to be here with you. All right, well, I'm glad that we are finally working together. Maybe we can start <laughs> off with a little more serious news, and let's start talking about Arizona and what's going on with you know Jan Brewer this time. Well, um, okay, so the state that didn't want to have a king holiday, I always throw that out there. Um, finally did go ahead and pass the law that said that businesses with a religious intent can discriminate against serving gay patrons or even those who are perceived to be gay. You didn't have to produce proof of it. Uh, Jan Brewer, the governor of that great and very hot state, did uh, veto this legislation. While uh, a lot of people- Because of her open heart and she finally realized she'd been bad in the past and now she's gonna be kind to people? Yeah, I'm sure having a, an international airline say, you know, we fly in and out of your state and we're having some consideration about this particular legislation. And uh, the calls for boycotts of the state, its commerce, its resorts, I'm sure that had nothing to do with it. Um, but her, her constituents who, you know, are inclined to believe that discrimination's an okay thing. Right, this know. is billed under the Religion of Freedom Bill. Or free, yeah. Is, yeah. So it just made it legal to, you know, to bring your hatred out into the open. Uh, just, also, the yeah. NFL was something we also wanted to talk about, that that was another of the pressure points, is Arizona's supposed to have the Super Bowl, and there's questions of whether oh, they'd- yes, you know, indeed. You know, well, you know, the Super Bowl, a multi, you know, million dollar event just in merchandise alone um, would have considered taking itself elsewhere. So I'm sure Jan Brewer just has a very big heart and a very waggy finger, yeah. and uh, that's why she did what she did. I, I um, am a little bit skeptical that her heart and her uh, intention to be free from religion, I mean, free to impose her religious feelings on commerce and people inside of her state, um, it, it, it really, it is 2014, right? Last in some, place, in some yeah. places, yeah. There a few hours back in Arizona. That's um, true. The other thing is, you know, in the NFL, when the first, you know, a gay player came out about a month ago, mm -hmm. I think the country was very supportive. I think that a lot of the players probably would be supportive. The owners weren't so supportive. And then recently there was what a lobbyist trying to petition to ban gay players from the NFL. Yeah, that'll happen. That'll happen. I mean, this is just this is just silly and it's stupid and it's senseless. Um, not that there are gay people playing in the NFL. I mean, a sport where 
you know, really buff men get to run around and smack each other's backsides and then pile up in a great big heap looking for the ball. I mean, that's that's kind of awesome. <laughs> and I think that's pretty hot. And go Steelers. Um, she meant uh, Cowboys. <laughs> Anyway, it came out wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, well, <laughs> and statistically, like if, if 10% of the population at least is gay that we know of, and maybe higher from some things I've heard you know, recently. Yeah. You um, know, it's a, yeah, so you're going to say, okay, no gay players in the NFL. Well, yeah, that, that ain't going to happen. I mean, I, I did play women's professional football for a year. Um, and it's hard. Yeah. I, thank you. Because it's true, I do. I was a D-line tackle for the DC Divas. Um, and frankly, the, the percentage of LGBT, um, well, actually, there no, there, there, I, to my knowledge, there weren't trans players on my particular team. But um, the percentage of LB, LGBT uh, players was higher than the percentage in the population. I mean, it, it just was. And Did that, uh, Was that a threat to your marriage and your lifestyle? Did that really hurt you? I, the only time I get upset when people are marrying each other is if I want to be married to a particular individual. So there are marriages I will protest. You know, anybody who marries Jaiman Hansu or um, anybody I want to be with, yes, I will protest those particular marriages. But, you know, um, just because two people of the same gender or whatever gender get married, it has nothing to do with me. I will protest, however. I think that um, people who are willfully unintelligent should not marry and breed. <laughs> but nobody's trying to ban marriages of, you know, Ray Ray and Pukietta. I mean, I, was I don't say, know. I noticed you didn't try to ban my marriage when I was getting married because you weren't overly concerned. Uh... I guess I'll take that for what it is. Um, we have in Texas, there's the legislation right where they just they had a judge came out and ruled that their ban on gay marriage was unconstitutional, or I think it was mm -hmm. a man. Um, one of the things that he said though was that I'm not doing this as a strike against the great people of Texas and the Texas legislature. You know, it's just the Constitution doesn't allow it. That mm -hmm. seemed like such a morally weak statement from the judge. Why wow. not say this is an incredibly bigoted thing that they're trying to do, but. That's not the reason I'm overturning it. It's because it's unconstitutional. You great people who want to strip away the rights and the humanity of a certain population, uh, you do have the right to do that. It's okay. Except I can't let you because it's not that you're bad people who want to do a bad thing. This is just against the Constitution. Um, yeah, the the pandering is just beyond that. It, it, it just, it's maddening, mm -hmm. it makes no sense, but the law is being upheld, so yeah. woohoo. Woohoo, we won. Yay. Now, speaking of bad people, you had some interesting news on CPAC. Can you tell us about that? Uh, <laughs> what a segue. So the Conservative Political Action uh, Conference that happens every year, um, I want to give a very special shout out to my dear friend, Kim Brown, who got verbally attacked by some white supremacists last year. Folks thought it was me. They heard of black woman reporter was mixing it up with a uh, white supremacist and my phone <laughs> went crazy. Everybody assumed it was me. And I was like, no, it's my coworker. I am stuck in traffic. But uh, this year it's going to be at the Gaylord Resort in uh, National Harbor in Maryland, right outside of DC. And uh, American Atheist, the President David Silverman got a booth, um, gonna show up. And the Family Research Council kind of had a little hissy fit that the atheists were infiltrating and how dare they. Uh, and then David, the same day, said, well, the, the religious right should be afraid that we are coming to shed light on the fact that you cannot conflate Republican values and the Republican Party with conservative Christian ideals. Uh, they have nothing to do with one another. So David and American atheists got uninvited. So he's going to show up anyhow and uh, be a participant. And he's going to be live tweeting and giving speeches and whatnot. And I will be there because I cover politics. <laughs> All right, well, I won't so, invite you. Yeah. And you said it might be Thursday this week. I just wanted to say that that's one of the reasons. Sometimes we say that if people like this show, they think it's valuable, and you want to try to help support it, um, they'll put a graphic up. And you, know, you can send a check to Fairfax Public Access, um, where you have Road to Reason on there. And some of the things that we would do with that money is we can try to cover events like this where it's really important. We'd love to, you know, to get some more coverage for that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. We appreciate any help from home. I'd now like to bring on Dr. Jennifer Michael Hecht. Um, Dr. Hecht earned her PhD in History of Science and European Culture at Columbia. 
She was a history professor for 15 years, now teaches poets and philosophy course in the graduate writing program at New School in New York City. She's a poet, historian, philosopher, and commentator. She's lectured at many top universities, been featured on uh, national television and radio. But today, she finally broke, broke through and has made it to Road to Reason. So uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. Okay. Um, and we thought maybe we can start. If you can um, tell us about one of your earlier books. We're going to spend about maybe 10 minutes talking about doubt. And if you can um, you know, tell us, Michael Shermer at a skeptics conference some years ago dubbed you the bard of skepticism. And your poetry certainly shows through in your prose. I didn't know you were a poet when I started reading it. And you know, it's beautifully written. Can you tell us you know, how you wrote that, why you wrote that? And um, you know, we'll go from there. How I wrote that out? Or how you how came to write. Like, What were the things that made you decide, I want to write this book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wrote a, a book called The End of the Soul, which came out of my PhD at Columbia. Uh, and this book was about a bunch of uh, scientists who formed the Society of Mutual Autopsy. They were waiting until each other died and then dissecting their brains to prove to the Catholic Church that the soul doesn't exist, um, which worked rather well. The Catholic Church actually changed the definition of the soul because of what they were doing. Um, but they, it became clear that they were atheists before they were anthropologists. And so I, I was doing research. I'm an atheist, so I was drawn to them partially for that reason. But I found that there really weren't good histories of atheism. They were all very polemic. Um, either everybody good through history was an atheist, which isn't true, and, or there are no atheists. Um, so I decided I was going to write a story that I knew. And then when I started researching it, I was shocked to see how much uh, more to it there was. I remember one of the points you had made was that it wasn't just a whole string of isolated, interesting tidbits, but you could really pull a coherent history together. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so I thought that was interesting. I also like how you said that it focuses on what goes on between the periods of certainty, right. uh, which is very different than most histories. Yeah, you know, a history of science does the same thing, really. It's going to focus on these periods where there's a lot of uh, secular philosophy and um, materialist work. Um, but histories of civilization tend to concentrate on, you know, here's the age of Catholicism, here's the age of Protestantism, and, and it, it follows these big uh, periods of a sort of agreement. And it just glosses over it's these sometimes longer periods where people are saying, uh, no, we, you know, just it goes out of favor and people are doing a different kind of thinking. So, you know, we know about the Greek gods. But we don't pay much attention to the fact that by Plato's time, you know, Plato wrote that all the youth were atheists. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love so much, Dr. Hecht, about doubt is that it really did just very clearly bring home that in every time, in every place, in every thought system, every group of people that you can identify, there were those who stood up and said, prove it. I am without belief in this. Um, from India to various cultures in Asia to everyone in between, yeah. there were those who had doubt. Um, so you yeah. did even atheism. You can even yeah. find atheism somewhere on the planet in a strong, vibrant, robust culture um, at all times. Mm -hmm. So when it disappears as a robust culture from the sixth century to the twelfth in Europe. It's going strong in the uh, in the Islamic world, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty big and innovative world at that time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, I expected there would be a dark, you know, a dark age where I'd be saying, you know, here be dragons, let's get back to the story. But no, it never went away. And as you said, it's connected. I didn't have to connect the story. Of course, I did as I saw themes. But e every century quoted the heroes of atheism and doubt from the centuries before. So they were, the, the story exists. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that I had to fabricate it, but to unearth it. And one of the other interesting points you made was that doubt has existed probably even before religion. And maybe you can walk us through some of the very early sure. skeptics. Uh, tell us about them. Sure. Well, the earliest very worked out atheism I found was the ancient Karbaka. Around 600 BC, that's before the Buddha, um, that's before any faith other than a version of Hinduism. And the Karvaka were making fun of that version of Hinduism. You know, they said if there were, um, 
if there were bodies, if there were if there were consciousnesses without bodies, there would also be mangoes that hang in the air without trees. But there aren't. Um, minds are part of these animals, and nature seems capable of generating people and uh, and the world. Um, they were thoroughgoing atheists. Then it, that made me think differently, and I started going back to the Hebrew Bible, which has some texts in it which, which are very old. And um, the Psalms are the oldest, and in them, there, you know, it's the ungodly this and the ungodly that. Uh, and you know, the religious explain that as, oh, these are people who just weren't very religious. It says ungodly. When you read these things without trying to make it sound something else, you 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 start to hear the atheists and the people who, who are saying no. Ecclesiastes, this you know, gorgeous text. It's from a little later on than the. The Psalms, but um, it really says, you know, better to be a live dog than a, a dead lion. There's no reason to think that the soul of man goes up and the dog rots. Uh, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, and and to, and that's where the dust to dust comes from. Very materialist talk. So the, the ancient world and even the preliterate world is full of it, full of doubt. And also, we can trace back the origin of an afterlife. We see the first, we see little notes about the afterlife in the Egyptian world. That's just for the pharaoh until the very late period. And even then, it's just for people who can sort of buy their way in, the, the upper class. So these are civilizations. Confucianism has no afterlife, and that's millions upon millions of people over generations upon generations. Theravada Buddhism, no gods, no supernaturalism. Uh, once I can date where something comes from, like I don't have to be agnostic about Superman. You know, I kind of know when he was made up. I, I, I get that um, and why, and I can cu culturally historicize him. So I feel the same way about this sort of idea of a Judeo-Christian God that we have. Um, can you tell us um, when, you know, certain concepts that are very prevalent in religion, when did the sort of devil come into play? And what has he, you know, what, what has the devil done for us um, that well, you know. I wanted to bring up the devil in terms of uh, my, new su my new book against suicide, because there's a period in the Middle Ages where he becomes very um, important in people's thinking. Um, it's thought very much that suicide is always, um, always a sort of crime of the devil. He lures you into it. And as ridiculous and crazy as that is, it did give people, we have records of, you know, there's a story of this woman wrote, uh, late Middle Ages, early, uh, early uh, modern age, um, which is earlier than one usually thinks, but about how she went through this night holding this knife and God didn't want her to kill herself and the devil did. And she, she was sort of fighting it in the persona of these two. And then she finally says that God wins and she puts down the knife. There are ways in which that was useful, even though it's, uh, you know, totally untrue, but it gave, it was a cultural force that helped people resist this. And, and in my new book, Stay, I, I'm arguing that secularists took a wrong turn when we decided that, that uh, suicide was a pillar of autonomy. Um, when we rethink that, it starts to fall apart, especially when we rethink it historically. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I should say that for later. Let me, um, maybe we can do a couple of other pre-Socratics. Um, you mentioned, and I'm probably butchering the uh, pronunciation, Xenophon, about mm -hmm. gods being silly. Can you review that a little bit? Well, sure. Um, you know, he, he was, uh, he made this wonderful observation that Ethiopians imagine their gods Ethiopian and um, the red-headed Thracians imagine their gods as red-headed Thracians and if oxen and, and uh, cows and, and horses could uh, imagine gods or if they could paint, they would paint their gods looking like them, that this was, self, this was a projection of one's own self. I wanted to, I'm glad you, you know, mentioned some of those parts. You know, we recently saw on Fox News where the anchor woman started talking right. about how Santa is really white and Jesus is really white, and right. it <laughs> seemed very much in line with uh, right. Xenophon. Right, right. Such wonderful nonsense. Yeah. Um, any other ancient, you know, doubters that we should be more familiar with? Well, yeah, there's tons, and some of them are extremely important through history. So Epicurus, uh, says, you know, we should not be afraid of the gods. There are no gods as, as anyone understands them. They're, they're really just a kind of uh, 
uh, shimmering image between the universes. They don't know what we're here. They didn't make the world. He was just sort of trying to, uh, you know, come up with like a, a reason, an allegorical reason for why people have been talking about them for centuries, just as we do with our, our own. Um, but yeah, Epicurus is so inspiring. People will quote him straight through history. They will never stop quoting him because he's so, uh, He's so sure that we can do it on our own, that the meaning of life is friendship. He, he cares about eating, but he much more cares who you're eating with. And that's why Epicureanism uh, nowadays is about food. But if you really study uh, the man and his text, though not many survive, but enough, uh, you see that he's really very much concerned with human interaction, friendship, that you can find all the meaning of life you need in that. And maybe we can um, jump to one more. You talked about Diagoras of Milos um, and what yeah. he did with the same. If you can talk about some of what he did with the Eleusin Mysteries. Yeah, Diagoras wanted to um, get people to stop being superstitious. And the Eleusin Mysteries were, um, that's one of the early places that we see a beginning idea of an afterlife, but it's only for club members, so you join. Um, and there were actual mysteries. So. There were things that were in baskets or in boxes that were paraded around to people, and they were told that this stuff was sacred, but they weren't shown what it was. And there were some things that initiates knew to say and do, and outsiders didn't know at all what they were. So yeah, it was an easy way to argue against superstition, which was to just tell everybody what was in the box or the basket, um, to say what the words were, and to say, look, this is not there's nothing sacred about this. It's mumbo jumbo. Right, sort and it's of, a lot of trouble. I sort of wondered with the Eucharist now, if you could remove that same um, special sacred categorization they get. If you saw you know, a priest at Kroger or Shop Mart and for a 10% <laughs> discount on wine and crackers, does that take 10% of Jesus out of it? But you know, seriously, if you lessen that sacred, untouchable nature of some of these ceremonies, and, you know, it, it just changes the way people are going to think, oh, it's crackers and wine. It has nothing to do with God, and, you know, so my morality doesn't come from it. You know, I think there's some value in exposing things that are supposed to be sacred that really are not especially, you know, different. It's hard to say with that one because it, it's been worked out for, you know, thousands of years. People have been thinking about how to explain that away. That's so really not something you can expose in the same way as something that's actually hidden from eyes. Yeah, you know, if you could convince someone in some new way, like maybe a child who'd never seen a package of, of uh, crap, you know, the, the, the host, um, that would be different. But most adults have, and they've really thought, you know, Catholics have thought through what, what, what happens, that something magical happens um, that really can't be disproven. They know it's a cracker. They've, they've thought for thousands of years about even the imperfections of the cracker. Do they go away when Jesus becomes the cracker? I mean, the whole <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay, I guess, I guess that feels like apologetics to me, but yeah, I, I guess I understand that. Um, do, maybe do you want to jump to a sort of some more modern doubters, talk about Thomas Jefferson. You were, we hear a lot that we're a Christian nation, and Thomas Jefferson, if there ever was a doubter, it seems like he was one of them. Oh yeah, he was, and, and there are several other presidents who, uh, who left pretty good records uh, that they were um, not at all believers in any conventional sense, and sometimes even more than that. Jefferson has, uh, he wrote a letter to a nephew, a favorite nephew, saying that, um, question everything. It will lead you to enlightenment and knowledge and question even the existence of God. Uh, because if you're wrong, he would rather you were a thinking person anyway. But if you decide he doesn't exist, says Jefferson, virtue will still win you over because of the good it does in the world and um, the way it makes you feel and the way other people uh, respond to you. Um, so he, he right out says it. Uh, Lincoln, it's surprising how many clear statements by people who knew him very closely, including his wife, said that you know he never let it escape his lips. That, that anything in the Christian ideology, anything at all, uh, was in, you know, in any, any part of his mind. He simply stayed away from that whole idea. Uh, and you know, it's a bunch of different friends who, who offer evidence of that afterwards. And Adams has letters back and forth with Jefferson that sound extremely uh, atheist, very anti-religion. That, that you can say for sure, that they both, you know, 
Adams writes to Jefferson and says, wouldn't the world be better if there had never been any religion and wasn't any now? Um, and Jefferson's the one who kind of says, well, you know, they do some good. Um, but yeah, our, uh, obviously there were people who were believers in our background too. Uh, you know, the Puritans were people who wanted to be more religious and got run out of, uh, of England from that. And, and so there was a tremendous amount of religiosity here. There was an equal amount, a cacophonous amount of people arguing that this is a secular world, that we all have uh, rights which we determine together. and. Um, and who wanted to build a better place. You know, a lot of believers just don't get how urgent morality seems to those of us who know that we're, we're the markers of morality. If you want good to exist, do good. That's it. That's what we got. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to transition from um, this little pamphlet of doubt about 500 pages. I'm excited to read the whole three. I've you know, gotten a good start on it. Um, and later this year, Jennifer said she might come back and talk to us about that. Now we'd like to move into your, your recent work and stay and philosophies against suicide. We're going to um, head to a little break right now. And when we come back, maybe you can do us a reading from one of the uh, sort of poems that you write, wrote as this started off. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humour and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, or there'll be hell to pay. Welcome to Student News with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm Liz Liddell, the Director of Campus Organizing, and I'm here to share some of the week's most exciting secular events and news happening on high school and college campuses across the country. SSA affiliates are being featured heavily in an upcoming CNN documentary on the secular community. The program will focus on the many challenges that seculars face in American society, including the coming out process and the ongoing efforts to educate our society about our secular worldview. Several Atlanta area student groups were filmed, including our signature Ask an Atheist tabling event. Last month, the Freedom From Religion Foundation successfully removed Bibles from the university-operated hotel at Iowa State University. Following this victory, we've partnered with the FFRF to expand that effort to other campuses around the country. Student activists and SSA affiliate groups are exploring university-operated hotels on their campus to see if Bibles are a part of the package, and looping in the FFRF to take formal action when they discover these violations of church-state separation. You can learn more and get involved at secularstudents.org slash report Bibles. The Interfaith Youth Corps is launching its second major campus religious climate survey over the next few weeks. This is the first comprehensive campus religious climate survey done by a national organization, and its results are highly valuable to the secular community. For example, last year's survey provided evidence that secular students in particular feel less welcome, less comfortable, and more subject to conflict and coercion on campus, which helps us promote our affiliate base and programs like the Secular Safe Zone. This year's survey is anticipated to be larger and more expansive than previous years. You can always learn more about secular students and their work on our website at secularstudents.org. This has been Student News with the Secular Student Alliance. I'm Liz Liddell, and I'll see you next time. Well, we'd like to thank Liz Liddell for that update. Uh, we'd also like to send out our best wishes to Kaylee Wilson, who's a teenager that um, has been very courageous and is getting stomped down by some uh, you know, Christian groups, and this is kind of not seeing the love of Christ, but if a, mm -hmm. you know, if a teenager has the uh, courage to try to start a group that's related to her, and then you have a lot of religious people obliterating it, hopefully this is something not just that the atheist and secular community will react to, but that some progressive religious people will come out and say, uh, you know, work with this teenager, not against her. Mm 
Happily, uh, in North Carolina, she wanted to start a secular student organization at her high school. The administration stonewalled her, wouldn't let it happen. The Secular Student Alliance got involved, as did the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and said, you know, there are these things called laws. And uh, Kaylee was allowed to form the group, but she said that she would not do so because of threats. So um, this is an issue that goes simply beyond just the secular um, community, uh, just beyond the fact that there are laws and students, if, if your school lets a, a religious group form, non-religious groups should be able to form. But um, this is a child being attacked. This is a child being threatened. And there is uh, a, a history of this kind of thing happening. So um, we, we send our support to Kaylee. And um, unfortunately, she is, well, fortunately, she's not alone. We're with her. Unfortunately, she's not alone. There are a lot of other students who need help, as she did. Yeah. All right. Well, Jennifer, welcome back. So maybe you can start um, with reading that poem that you wrote and then explain to everybody what brought that about and how it led to stay. Sure. Um, uh, I think I'll just say a few words first in that um, I, I, I find in poetry it's possible to say things before you fully understand them. That's, that's why we write poetry in a way. Uh, it's a freer realm. And so this is where I first started saying something that uh, surprised even me in some ways. Um, and then I went on to think about it. Um, pardon me. The no hemlock rock. Don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. Don't. Eat a donut. Be a blown nut. That is, if you're gonna kill yourself, stand on a street corner rhyming seizure with Indonesia and wreck it with racket. Allow medical terms, rave and fail, be an absurd living ghost if necessary, but don't kill yourself. Let your friends know that something has passed or be glad they've guessed, but don't kill yourself. If you stay but are bat crazy, you will batter their hearts in blooming scores of anguish, but kill yourself and hundreds of other people die. Poison yourself, it poisons the well. Shoot yourself, it cracks the biodome. I will give badges to everyone who's figured this out about suicide and hence refused it. I am grateful. Stay. Thank you for staying. Please stay. You are my hero for staying. I know about it, and I'm grateful you stay. Eat a donut. Rhyme opus with lotus. Rope is bogus, psychosis. Stay. Hocus pocus. Hocus pocus. Don't kill yourself. I won't either. It's in my uh, new poetry book called Who Said? Copper Canyon. Now, so, now that didn't yeah. come out of nowhere. Yeah, where? What? what happened that led you to write that kind of a... Well, it's a combination of um, experiencing some uh, sort of miserable dark times myself, as most of us have, and um, being aware that I didn't have some of the superstition that uh, people like and gets them through these things. Um, doesn't always, obviously. There are lots of miserable religious people, but um, I, I was doing a lot of thinking about that. I, I read Mary Carr's Lit. Uh, about her alcoholism and depression. And I felt that there was just such company in her book, in her depression. She starts out as an atheist, and she ends up through AA believing, and then eventually a Catholic, full-blown Catholic at the end. And that really was no, no company for me at all. Like, that's not going to happen to me, mm -hmm. um, you know. But I've been so sad that I tried to talk to the sky for a minute, but it was like talking to my hand. I felt silly and stopped, right? Um, and so it was with that kind of thinking on my mind uh, when I heard about a, a poet friend of mine who had taken her life. Um, we'd uh, gone to Columbia together, um, got our PhDs in different departments, but and then we'd known each other in the city, as poets do. Um, and I wrote the poem, uh, feeling I had begun to I had begun to be really thinking very much because of doubt and the, the role that that gave me. People wrote to me and asked me things and I would give them the best philosophies that I could from the text. You know, doubt 
really turned out to not be just a litany of people who said they don't believe, um, though that's an incredibly fascinating thread, but it's also how those people then suggest we do live, how we find meaning, um, how, we, how we should imagine the situation that we're in. So it felt like it was partly my job to be thinking about this, and it was also a very emotional uh, situation, but I was working it out and thinking about it a lot, not in terms of writing anything, and then a second poet friend, one who knew the first one uh, with me, we were all up at Columbia together. And um, yeah, it was a little over a year. And it just made me write this blog post. I thought I was talking mostly to um, poets. It was on the Best American Poetry site where I blog sometimes. And um, it kind of went a little viral. Uh, the Boston Globe wrote to me and asked me if they could publish it in their print version and came out and beautifully, and I got a ton of email, mostly from secularists, but also from people who just like the message. Um, and these letters, and they're coming in a lot now because the books come out, are people telling me that this message saved their lives, um, which is a pretty, it's a pretty heavy kind of thing to be happening. Um, but yeah, from those first ones, it wasn't so much you've saved my life, but it was thank you for the company of talking about this. And it was also thank you, I'm going to give this to my son or my wife, people who they, somebody wanted to say stay to, and they didn't quite have the authority. And I'd gotten authority from doing this kind of research and thinking about it, where I, I was ready to say secularism had made a little bit of a wrong turn, and we've done it before. Uh, you know, Diderot thought there'd be no more marriage after we got rid of the church, but secularists have walked down to the uh, to the to the town square and gotten married um, uh, for the centuries yeah. since. And yeah, um, yeah so say, one, one of the yeah. beautiful images that you create is getting the whole community sort of linking arms and holding each other up and getting that kind of support, um, which is very poetic, but also it really talks about that we're all part of a community. Um, and one of the other big points you make is that suicide is not a victimless crime. And maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, the two main arguments that I sort of thought of and then found in history and, and was able to think much more uh, broadly as I found other people's ideas in history um, the first idea is that we owe it to others, which may sound harsh, but the truth is the moment you realize how important you are to others, meaning that if you take your life, some people will die. We have really good statistics and also a historical record of hundreds of years of people saying this, that they noticed um, that suicide was contagious. Um, but the wonderful thing is that means that if you stay alive when you want to die, you are making a contribution. You, you don't have to be of use every moment of your life. Sometimes you feel like a burden. I mean, about a third to a half of suicide notes mention that they're a burden. And if, only, if I only get that out to people, no, a burden would be if you killed yourself. Yeah, you're a burden. We're all burdens. We're human beings. It happens. And it happens worse at some times than others. But killing yourself can really take other people's lives and ruin other people's lives in ways you can't predict. You can't decide that just your stepfather's going to feel the pain of it. He may end up getting attention for it, right? You don't know. Um, and so it's, but also statistics show that many people who try it, the vast majority, overwhelming, um, are glad that they survive, the ones that survive. And the other part of the argument on the other side of community is uh, your future self. I'm arguing on one hand that we're all connected and reminding us about how we smoke and quit smoking together, we gain weight and lose weight together, we eat healthy or not healthy, we do all sorts of dangerous things as a group, we move to certain places, have a third child, all sorts of life decisions. And suicide is a kind of a trend decision. Misery isn't, but the action of suicide, that is. And it comes and goes and we can plot it. But the other part of my argument is that the self isn't quite real also because of how much we change our minds. We fall in and out of love, right? We'll get married and get divorced. People uh, move to a, to a place and love it and then decide they don't love it anymore and leave jobs. We have very different selves. Right, and, and I like your point that you made about we rob from our future selves because things do change and you've also mentioned that depression, 
does abate to some degree for most people with or without treatment. Um, so it's not right to let your worst mood kill all your others. Right. Now, can, can you also talk about, you know, you, you try to create the argument that you owe something to your community because other people will die if you do this, and maybe we can talk about some statistics with that. But separately, doesn't the community owe something to the individuals? Like when we have... Yeah, gratitude. Like, what's that? Gratitude. That's the one thing that I wasn't able to find in history, that we owe each other gratitude for staying. If you stay alive instead of killing yourself, my niece has a better chance. We do this thing as a group. And, and it comes in clusters, whether you call it contagion or influence. But um, yeah, you know, there, there were, there's a, a, an ex-army ranger who wrote a piece for the Daily Beast uh, saying that uh, he was mourning three friends who killed themselves, all, all army rangers. And he felt terribly guilty and, and confused and miserable. And then he, he read something I wrote and said, oh, so how to save the next bunch of people is I get help. Mm -hmm. OK, can you talk about some of the statistics both in the military? You know, you talk about how many people die from combat versus how many are committing suicide. And then just so people understand how big a problem this is, you know, suicide's sad, and, you know, but most people don't need to worry about it. Or is this really affecting thousands of people? Yeah, it's affecting. Look, 10 years ago, we were shocked when it hit 30,000 a year. That's more than most diseases, conditions, dangers that we fear. And at our most recent count, 2010, it hit 40,000 a year. So it had gone up 10,000 extra people. And we're talking about, we saw the, the rates jump in the army, in the military. Uh, it jumped hugely. Um, it jumped in the age category of 15 to 25. Um, baby boomers are it's skyrocketing uh, now that they've hit their 50s and 60s. And um, they're really, uh, we see these, this rise across the culture. And you got to figure, many of these people five years earlier didn't know they were at risk, right? We're not, it's not all depressed people. It's sometimes people who are exhausted and uh, have had a life reversal. Um, in the army, we, we can see. A third of the army suicide, not just army, all the military, a third of them were never deployed. Hmm. Another third was deployed only once. I remember but in terms but of about 50% of them had had a major life reversal in the three months before. A relationship broke up or they were scolded at work or something. And, and look, the, the big religions these days are not doing a very good job of keeping people from killing themselves. Mm -hmm. But for us, we have to be aware. It's not just science. We have to be aware of poetry and community and culture and the ways that all the other people it, through history who have not had an afterlife or uh, an omniscient God who's taking care of meaning, they've all had cultures that help support them. And we need to return to that. But that, that was one of the points I was trying to get at earlier is that every individual might owe the community something in the sense if you commit suicide, your niece has a higher risk. I understand that. We have to realize that these life changing events that, you know, if we have a, a system that excludes a huge amount of people from success and so they have, their life is always on the margin. It's not surprising. You know, like when, when the economy crashes, uh, some statistics show that I saw that, you know, in the depression, your rates of suicide go up when the economy is doing well. For more people, no, or I don't know, you can give me some statistics. Yeah, uh, wars usually slow down suicide. People feel together. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in the Depression, we saw a certain spikes of suicide in certain kind of professions, older white men who lost everything. Um, but then there were other people who no longer felt like they had to hide that their sweater had a hole in it. There can be things about a bad cult. Also, this steep rise that we've seen in the last 15 years started before the economy crashed. And we also have a lot of wealthy people committing suicide. So um, it's, it's confusing, but we can see some definite themes. And one of them is the way we influence each other. So that means we're very, very powerful. And we have to feel that on all different levels and know that people care about us by the sheer fact of how devastated we are when someone that we knew and cared about even a long time ago takes their life. And, this is observed, um, you know, both uh, in studies and anecdotally. Uh, you know, if you talk to people, you hear this. 
Now, I want to hop in here and go back to a point you made earlier, uh, Dr. Heck, about how uh, modern churches and religion aren't doing a very good job of keeping people alive. I want to interject a cultural argument into this. Um, I am African American. One of the things that you will hear African Americans, women in particular, talking about is that um, you know, the, the Lord requires that you lay your burden down to him. When you are in situations of distress, you, you call out to Jesus and the Lord will never give you more than you are able to bear. Because of this cultural ideal, black folks in this country are among the least likely to go and seek professional help. Um, these are folks who are more likely to just double down on the prayer. And, um, you know, you see high rates of obesity, which some studies have correlated to uh, trauma in some way. People are eating themselves to death rather than and young doing it. with guns. Yeah. That's, that's a version of suicide to, you know, when you, when you are willing to um, put yourself in that kind of position. There are times when we'll see, like if a celebrity kills themselves, the same age, race, and gender will see a spike. Um, it's remarkable the degree to which it holds. Sometimes it won't happen with young men, but if you look over to single car accidents, mm -hmm. you see the spike there. So sometimes people have a way of killing themselves that doesn't always get recorded as killing themselves. I think with young black men, we have to, we have to see that, that there's a way of putting yourself in danger. And you're right with, um, with different kinds of unhealthy things. And, you know, there's no way to, I simply don't speak too much to the whole issue of doing dangerous things. I mean, you look at someone like Philip Seymour Hoffman, that, that's a version of suicide, but it's not one that I'm talking about because, you know, where do you draw the line? You know, don't eat that chocolate or you're, you're I mean, we, we, we have to have yeah. freedom to live our lives, but it's also possible for us to step back and ask this question about, about, uh, whether suicide deserves a different, a different conversation. But what you're saying is absolutely true. And, you know, I don't wish there was a God or an afterlife. I'm okay with death. I, I, I don't like other people's death, but like, I, I'd like to have a full life. And, and it's enough already. Um, yeah, you know, can I pick up on something? Go on and on, walking back and forth from the computer to the refrigerator and not having the cake. I mean, you know, you, you live a good life and you look at this life and say, well, it's pretty awful in a lot of ways, you know. But if you are a person who can give up your burdens to something invisible, that sounds very attractive and, and it's wonderful. And there are lots of atheists who wish they had that. Um, I don't think we need it. I think we need to be more inventive and uh, Historical. That's why doubt is such a big deal to me because it's it tells you that people have been doing this for a long time, managing without religion. Can, well, we need to take those inf pieces of information. Can, can I? I want to make sure we get this in before we get further. You wrote this book um, about a very specific type of suicide. Can you you know, explain different maybe categories oh, and who sure. you wrote this for and who it, what, what it wasn't about? Right. Thank you. I, I'm not at all talking about assisted suicide or or. To me, if your doctor and people in your family and your friends agree that that you're that it's too much already, um, and that you're in pain and you don't have a future, that's a whole different category. I, I have no judgment about that. That's between that's that needs to be adjudicated on individual cases. When I first started writing about this, I was very clear about it, and some people who were um, uh, not healthy contacted me and said, no, we need this message too. Sometimes the culture makes us feel like a burden and people are somewhat coerced into thinking that they're supposed to end their lives. So I've been a little more careful about that since, but mostly I'm talking about despair suicide. I'm talking about a basically healthy person or a person who's certainly not about to die or in agony, who's having trouble with meaning of life stuff to the degree that they, they think they have to come up with whether or not they deserve to live on their own. And I am trying to swoop in and say, you know, you can lean on the secular philosophers of all of history. And when you read their stories, it makes you feel less lonely. It makes you feel, it gives you ideas. And, and writing stay was for me, uh, revolutionary. It, it uh, I, I feel um, that it's possible to put up a, a, a suicide barrier on the bridge in your mind 
and simply walk across the bridge. Um, it sounds, I'm not saying that you can shake, shake yourself out of misery. I am saying that suicide is a behavior that you can choose before you get miserable is not going to be your behavior. Hey, can you talk specifically, you mentioned you're the bridge bearer, there's both you know, metaphorical and then there's the literal one. Yes. Don't, how well do those things work? If, you, if there's a hot spot for suicide, like you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, does that make a difference if you put up physical barriers and make it harder for people to commit suicide? Yeah, tremendous. It's amazing how single-minded and impulsive uh, suicide seems to be, so that um, if you uh, put up a, a fence, we have great evidence that the person just goes home. They don't go to a different bridge. Uh, in England, they just made, in the 90s, they made acetaminophen available only in bubble packs and in packets of six. You could go to a bunch of pharmacies and get 50 of them and, and sit there and take them out of their bubble wrap, but immediacy changes everything. Over 50% of suicides in this country are with guns, and over 50% of gun deaths in this country are suicide. Having a gun in a house, if you are feeling suicidal, is not a good idea. It is not the way to make it through the night. I really, I encourage people, and somebody who wrote to me saying that I changed their mind, that they're not vacillating about suicide anymore after 30 years of it, um, because I opened their minds to a very simple idea of how their children would suffer. And we have studies that show the suicidality of children of suicides is double, triple, quadruple, depending on who you are and what age it happens. And that's clearly not genetic because it happens what age the kid is when the parent does it changes when and how long their suicidal behavior and action uh, takes place. Um, and, and you also, just to clarify, you made it clear that it wasn't just having a parent die, like, you know, tragic things happen. It's no, more if somebody has suicide, that's what led to the spike. Super careful. Yeah. Right. I mean, they were careful to such a to fault to the point where at the end of it, they had to say, it's, it might be much, much larger than this because we took anyone out of the study who might confuse it. Right. Um, and the, and immediate, the immediacy that you pointed out, <clears throat> I think, is another key point that, and you know, one of the statistics you said that was that people that didn't complete that suicide by jumping off the bridge, something like 94% of them, a, a huge right. amount, it's, it's, many years yeah. later, were still alive. It's not like you said, it they don't go to another- what I was saying, which was that in, in this one letter from this guy, um, just a magnificently written letter too. Uh, he said that he, when he's feeling good, he writes himself a note saying, I am happy right now. And he goes and looks at it when he's depressed. And he said he can hardly believe it, but it's in his handwriting. And I encourage people to do that. I think it's a great idea. And you don't even have to physically do it. Just tell yourself now, when you feel the worst, that's not how you always feel. So just go to bed for a while, go talk to someone. I mean. You got to get help, um, and and uh, help works. Right? Can you talk it's about also about ideas? This isn't just about mental health. It isn't just about wartime trauma. It isn't just about the economy. It's about ideas. Ideas matter. But I like your idea. You said about taking suicide off the table as an option, and you know, like people with something as simple as a diet. If you let yourself have Doritos and you negotiate with yourself, you always end up peeing. If you simply decide, I'm not having this, it's much easier to stick with. And um, I'm sorry, we're getting a lot of echo. That um, problem with suicide, taking off the table intellectually, I think, works very well. Um, so right. Well, I'm certainly getting emails and actual letters from people saying that they feel that they're not tortured by this because they realize it's, it's not the thing to do. And like I said, most other cultures don't leave it to each individual to establish the meaning of existence. You are aware that your community matters. You're aware that, uh, that, that you matter and that culture matters and that you can lean into it and trust it a little bit. Look, when we were teenagers, we all looked at the ticky tacky houses and said, I don't want to be just everybody else, right? And now we're like, oh, I've got a house, great. You know, I mean, your life changes and you realize that being, that culture knows some things. It knows that love works, you know. It knows that some very uh, ordinary ways of living are, are, are really deep and beautiful. Um, if, if, you, if you hook up with other, if you connect with other human beings and you, you know, force yourself a little bit. Um, as I've written in many other places, uh, the happiness myth uh, talks about this a lot. We 
used to have to gather around the one, the one best fireplace. There was no entertainment other than other people. And other people are a pain. We all know this. They can be dull. They can be annoying. They're very competitive. And so we've all voted with our feet and our money. We each have our own room with the AC instead of going to the front porch and talking to people. We have computers and televisions and all these ways to be solitary. But deep down, we're all connected still. And we do have to show ourselves that in a way that historically people haven't had to show themselves. It was pretty obvious. The one question that I know you get all the time that we have to bring up once again because it, it's just, I think, obligatory. Um, for those of us who are without the belief in the supernatural higher power, for those of us who find morality and meaning in one another because we don't believe that any gods exist, um, how do we hear this message? How do we find the meaning to keep us here when there's no one in the afterlife to whom we will have to account? That's a great question, and I believe that Sartre and Bertrand Russell were wrong when they said that each person has to make their own meaning. Uh, and it's a controversial notion, but I believe that the feeling of meaning is sufficient to the definition of meaning, just like the feeling of love is sufficient to the definition of love. So even if it all breaks down to hormones in the lab, uh, you know, a mother uh, knows how she feels about her kid and knows that 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 conversation is better had in poetry and music and these other ways that, you know, being human is weird. And nothing about science is ever going to make the idea that the meat thinks not weird. But the meat made up Shakespeare and, and Mozart. And um, being human is strange. And I've called it poetic atheism uh, because I wanted to separate myself from the world that thinks atheism means all materialism. We're human. It's not all material. It's a very strange thing. And I believe that, that the fact that, you know, I care about you and you care about me, I believe that that's a real thing. And the fact that, that Bach did his thing, it's a real thing that we can start, a, we can trust. The feeling of meaning is sufficient to the definition of meaning. And we are not responsible for coming up with it all by ourselves, each of us. It doesn't have to be some third party that made up morality for morality to be real, right? We know when we're, you know, we know it's wrong to kill on, on a very fundamental level. It's human. Human beings seem to have invented morality, right? Because, I mean, these people who say that religion invented morality, so now without religion there's no morality. Uh uh. Right, evolution, we, evolution offers a very good explanation. Um, we're going to rock with that. I don't know if you can hear us. Um, but evolution gave a real good expression for that. And I guess we're out, although I'm not sure of the clock, so we'll see if we paid <laughs> out or not. If so, thank you for joining us. Thank you.